My name is Paul Tuttle. I'm the first Managing Grants Consultant at Hanover Research. I was in, uh, as Anne-Marie read from my bio, I was in three different UNC system schools, University of North Carolina system schools. So you will hear my accent. So if you don't understand something, please speak up. But I, I hope that it's not a sleep-inducing accent. Sometimes it used to be for my students when I was teaching college-level writing. Um, wanted to place this into, into perspective. As Anne-Marie and Chuck have said, this is all about helping you do scholarly work. And in many cases, you cannot do scholarly work without having external funds coming in to help you do that. And of course, with the expectations ratcheting up of doing more scholarly activity, you need the tools with which to rise to meet those expectations, those increased expectations. So that's the reason why I'm here. And I just wanted to emphasize that. Um, moving on to the next slide, what we'll be doing is covering these five topics, understanding funding announcements, writing grant narratives, developing smart objectives and outcomes, program budgeting, and planning for program evaluation and sustainability. So what we're going to be doing basically is throughout, I'm going to be talking, but I expect you also to speak up. If you have a question, to say, stop, Paul. You know, I have a question. I, I, I want to clarify something. I'd like to know more. I'm happy to be interrupted. And all of this is being recorded on Camtasia, just to let you know. Okay. <laughs> and I'll repeat the question so that, so that this will be um, able to be reviewed online afterward as well. So if we could go to the next slide, please. So the first set, set of slides is all about understanding funding announcements, where they are, where they come from, all that sort of thing. If we can switch to the next slide, please. Basically, as you all have been probably following the news, we have a, a, a rather contentious process at the federal level for uh, creating and appropriating funds for funding opportunities by the federal government. There are, of course, multiple agencies of the federal government whose jobs are either purely or, or nearly purely to give out grant funds to accelerate research in certain areas. So, Anne-Marie, you wanted to? Perfect, perfect, perfect. And uh, just, just to place this in context, the, the uh, pivot software that, that Anne-Marie just mentioned is, if I understand correctly, the largest database in the free world. <laughs> yes, 30-something thousand they advertise, and, and, it's, and it's worldwide. So if we have eligibility, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, if you have eligibility, you can apply for a number of these kinds of opportunities. But I wanted to talk, to back up just a moment and talk about the funding trends and where they come from. The funding trends come from people like you who either are in academia or have been in academia who work at policy institutes, at federal agencies, in different kinds of positions in the federal government, in different kinds of positions at foundations as well, think tanks, those kinds of things, and collectively these funding trends rise up. Uh, there were, of course, funding trends recently in supporting STEM education, in supporting nanotechnology as an innovation engine, those sorts of things. Those are just a couple of three examples in supporting advance, advancing uh, or increasing the numbers of women in the STEM fields. Um, those are funding trends that arose out of a collective shared opinion that this is a good thing to be doing. So really, as you all know, scholarly work is all about adding to the discipline, but it's also making the world better doing something, even in a small way, to make the world better. And so you're a part of that. And with these funding opportunities, you are also a part of that. Now, as you all know, I've got the second bullet point up here that says President's Budget Request OMB website. As you all know, every year, the President makes what's called a budget request. And that's on the Office of Management and Budget website. Depending on how fully the legislative branch agrees with the president's budget request, you can expect to see some or all of those possibilities actually enacted into law and appropriated and becoming funding opportunities. Of course, we have a sort of contentious relationship right now between the executive and the legislative branches, and so we're not sure at this point exactly what's going to happen in terms of all of these things 
how all of these possibilities are going to be playing out. But what we do know is that there are some there are some shared points of agreement, and we know that there are some places that people are going to fund, even if they might fund it at less than what the president has requested. And this is a this is an appropriations process that happens every year. So Congress, doing its job, has to go through this entire budgeting process every single fiscal year. And by the way, the fiscal year for the federal government is typically different from that of an academic institution. The fiscal year for the federal government is October 1 through the following September 30. Typical academic institutions have a fiscal year of July 1 through the following year, June 30. Typical IRS fiscal year is, of course, January 1 through December 31st, that calendar year. And then, of course, if you think about a fiscal year for a project, once it's awarded, that has its own start date and end date. And so it will have its own fiscal years. So you'll have to think in terms of fiscal year at least four different ways, just letting you know. Why do agencies fund? I think that's a question that a lot of people have. And I'm just going to start there with that, that basic question. The first is this third bullet point. The first reason is because they feel it's an investment. They, too, are trying to do something good in the world. They, too, are trying to fulfill their missions. They, too, are trying to make something happen, make some change, solve some problem, fill some gap. They, too, are trying to do that, just as you are, and just as you did with perhaps a senior thesis, master's thesis, doctoral dissertation. You made a contribution to the field, just as you will when you write up the results of the research that you do based on the funding that you might receive. There's also funding as an obligation, this fourth bullet point here. In terms of funding as an obligation, let me just say that as a 501c3 organization, many foundations have to give away a certain percentage of their endowments or of their uh, assets every single year in order to remain nonprofit. There's a, there's a proportion or a percentage that they have to give away. They have to make grants to that proportion and so they are obliged to be charitable, philanthropic, and to give grants. So you know that there will be money coming from them. And you know because uh, agencies have missions to give grants, and sometimes that's their only mission, you know that that's also an obligation of theirs. So you know that there's money out there. You know that there are possible avenues for you to do your scholarly work. Next slide, please. They have stepped up to the plate. The question was, uh, the question was all about a comparison between funding trends in the federal government and funding trends in the private sector, the foundations. Um, the foundations have stepped up to the plate, and they have said point blank, what what the federal government cannot fund or will not fund, we might fund or we will fund, and they have made that statement very explicitly, especially since the. Um, the uh, market, the housing market implosion of late 2009, uh, the foundations have really stepped up. And so what you'll find is you'll find a, a, a collaboration among foundations. You'll also find a collaboration among foundations and federal agencies or a collaboration among federal agencies that really is all about these funding trends. And again, it's policymakers, it's academics like yourself, it's people who call up the program officers and say, and say you know, I noticed that you had this. It's very close to what I do, but it's not quite what I do. Is there any possibility that next year we might have something that's closer to what I do? There are ways in which you can actually influence the funding landscape, and we can talk about that a little bit later, perhaps in the Q&A. So here are the typical types of funders, federal agencies, state and local government agencies, which often get the money from the federal government and actually have what's called flow-through money, they have to report the uh, results of their investment to the federal government, which then the federal agencies have to report then to Congress. So there's a reporting, reporting function on bullet points one and two. Then also you have national, regional, local, family, community, and corporate foundations that are, again, set up as nonprofits, set up with that proportion that needs to be um, expended every year in order to remain nonprofits. 
Then there are also professional and industry associations, perhaps yours. There might or might not be one or more of your, uh, some funding opportunities within one or more of your professional or industry associations that you belong to. And also businesses and companies will fund research, will fund scholarly activity, will fund investigations into solving problems, filling those gaps. Others, um, we actually have had combinations of these types of funders come forward and say, as a consortium, we together will fund that. So that's what the others catch all is right there. The, the combinations or consortia of these types of funders. In terms of the uh, types of solicitations, in terms of the uh, types of solicitations we have, we have a variety of different funding opportunity types. And I want to talk first about the first bullet point and the third bullet point, the program announcements and the broad agency announcements. Basically, they are almost the same thing. Program announcements are put out by non-defense agencies. Broad agency announcements are put out by defense agencies. So if you're looking at um, any kind of scholarly activity that relates to the Air Force Office of Scientific Research or the Army Research Office or the Office of Naval Research, you'll probably be looking at broad agency announcements. These come out every one to two years, and they have a selection of these are the topics that we are interested in. They aren't necessarily military specific topics, but they do have an influence on the military mission often. So for example, well, and, and also NASA in its, in, its, um, in its race to the moon and its later race to Mars and things like that put out broad agency announcements. So NASA and the defense agencies typically use the broad agency announcement as a funding mechanism. So what they will do is one, every one to two years they will put out a selection of topics an omnibus solicitation, you might have heard that term, an, an omnibus solicitation, where all of the different possible funding topics that they might be interested in are listed, and a single way of getting in, of, of, uh, of, of getting in touch with a program officer, here's how to do it, here's whom you should contact, you have these, these points of contact listed by each topic, et cetera, and that'll tell you exactly how to get involved in those kinds of investments. In terms of program announcements, those are usually put out by National Science Foundation or National Institutes of Health. Similarly, they are a program announcement of multiple topic areas, but they typically are more uh, focused topic areas. So they would be taking one subsection of our entire mission, for example. So you'll see a program announcement for um, cancer research or cancer survivorship research maybe from the National Cancer Institute and or some other institutes and centers at NIH that do that sort of cancer survivorship work or have some interest in that. And so you'll have a program announcement that goes over a large topic area and asks for just a wide variety of, of subtopics within that, but the program announcements really are a smaller subset of what a broad agency announcement covers. Perfect, perfect, thank you. And that is actually a request for proposals or request for applications. Um, this is a very targeted, very focused kind of thing. And typically for National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health, they give you either two or in the case of NIH, three years plus funding deadlines over those two or three years so that you can actually plan ahead. So that if you miss the first year or if you're not really prepared that first year, you and your team can be better prepared the second and or third year in order to take advantage of that funding opportunity. There are also, in terms of other kinds of funding arrangements, contracts and cooperative agreements and provision of sponsor services. Let me, let me just talk briefly about contracts. Contracts are not like grants. Grants, they give you the money, they expect you to report on it, but if you do not find something or if you only do part of the work, you're not necessarily having to give back the money. Contracts, though, you're providing a deliverable. And if you don't provide the del deliverable, you lose the money, and the money goes back. And so contracts are actually when you are um, providing services or providing a prototype of something, some new technology, 
that's what contracts are typically used for. Cooperative agreements are typically used for um, some arrangement in which the agency actually helps perform the research or has some oversight over that investigation. So because they want to be involved in this whole process, they issue a cooperative agreement rather than a grant or a contract. And then provision of sponsor services, that happens when, um, when the sponsor actually says, well, I'm not going to give you any money. I'm going to give you consulting services that are valued at this amount of money. Or I'm going to give you this kind of information that is valued in this way. Or I'm going to give you some assistance that is valued in this way. That's relatively rare. Typically, it's a grant or a contract or a cooperative agreement that would go through Anne Marie's office. Here's a slide that shows the kinds of things that I typically look for first in a solicitation. And you'll see flipping through that, Mark, right? Yeah. You'll see flipping through that that the, um, the eligibility is very close to the front. There's a reason for that. That's so that you don't get very, very happy only to have your expectations dashed when you realize you're not eligible. Okay? Right, right, right. So, so it's not only, the eligibility is not only about your particular disciplinary area. You said that it's not architecture in here, right? And there might be a gender thing too, because it's for advancement of women in science. There might be a gender situation there too. Okay. Right, 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 exactly. But, but I mean, you can, you can help do that, but you, you might not be PI. It might be more persuasive to have a, a, a woman PI on that. Just saying. Um, but there's also the type of awardee issue. What institution or what organization are you coming from? What resources does it have? Is it an academic institution? It is, is it a research institute? What exactly is it? And sometimes there are limitations as to what type of awardee it is. Because remember, you're writing the grant as the principal investigator or as the co-investigator, but the award is coming to your organization because your organization is, is authorized to accept that award, not you, in most cases, 98% of the cases. I, I don't want to muddy the water here by really talking about the fellowships and things like that that come to people individually that are also called grants. Those are different, and I, I, I don't want to muddy the water with that. There are also geographic limitations. Sometimes during the proposal process, people say, if you are from states that begin with the letter M, you can apply. Or if you are from this section of the country, you can apply. Or in terms of the award side, sometimes award decisions are based on making sure that there's a geographic distribution. Just letting you know. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely, and, and while we're talking about that, let, let's go ahead and, and say that with the pivot, you can actually set up, um, and they, they still do this, correct me if I'm wrong, but they still allow you to have uh, weekly alerts yes. Yes. Based, on, based on your pivot searches so that you can actually set up something that has your eligibility, meaning your own personal eligibility, your discipline, where you are in your academic career, whether or not you have a master's or a PhD, that sort of eligibility, plus what kind of institution you're at. Uh, whether you're at a foundation, whether you're at an institution like this one, what kind of institution you're at, plus the geographic location. And it's really, it's really easier than you think. It'll look very complicated and cumbersome on the face of it, but it's a great deal easier than you think because in just 10 or 15 minutes, you'll be set up with at least one profile and also one search. It, it can be very, very quick. And, um, and you can even do uh, test searches in order to make sure that you've selected the right things. And I'm sure, Anne-Marie, you, you know how to help with that and set all those things up. Yeah, where they changed And they changed it a little bit, yeah. They did. They have, they have. And, and they've simplified things where they really shouldn't have simplified. But that, that's another, that's my opinion. Because um, I've, I've been in this field for a dozen years, and I, I, I liked being able to really atomize the data, you know? And, 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 and being able to, to check this and not check that, but it was a huge long list of check this and check that, and other people found it very intimidating. I was geeky enough to say, okay, I love this. You know, this, this is really useful to me. And I was able to help faculty members, you know, check exactly the box that they needed. And that, that, was, that was nice. But they've made it simpler, and, and, and so you'll get 
you'll get things that are still very tailored to what you want, but you may may or may not receive a few more things that are sort of on the edge of what you want, some, some sort of bleeding over into something that you might not want. So you'll have to check those out. Um, in terms of the uh, other key solicitation elements, you're also going to find in all solicitations a funding amount and a project period. This will also let you be able to choose or discard the opportunity very quickly. Because if you cannot do what you want to do within that funding limitation or within that time period, if they say that this is only 500 grand for two years and you're saying, gosh, no, really, I need a million over five years, well, obviously that solicitation is not for you, not for that project that you're thinking of. So you need to think, up, think about, well, do I need to telescope up or down? Do I need to shrink my idea down to fit this? Or would it really be a situation of trying to fit something into a box that it really won't fit into? So you have to make that choice. The next piece is program goals and submission instructions. Every single funding opportunity goes along with a funding program, which goes along with an investment by that funder, by that federal funder, by that foundation, whomever. They're making an investment. They have what's called a program of investments. Within that program, the program officer has a portfolio. So they are trying to do something in the world with this money. Again, it's an investment. They are going to be selecting from among all the proposals the ones that best fulfill their programmatic goals and best flesh out their portfolio. So you're going to be presenting your idea as the best or among the best possibilities for fitting into these programmatic goals. So you're going to be looking at not only the agency or the funder mission and vision, but you're also going to be looking at what has been funded recently in this area. You're going to be having a conversation with the program officer and you're going to be saying, okay, you know, I'd really like to do this. I'm really interested in this. And if they tell you in that phone call or in that email communication, well, I'm so sorry, that was, you know, on the cutting edge three to five years ago. We're not really funding that right now. You know that that's not really for you. If on the other hand, they, they become really excited and they say, I want to know more. Can you give me an abstract? Can you give me, a, you know, more of your ideas? Can you give me a budget? Can you tell me all about it? You know, you've landed a really big fish. So think about that. Think, think about how it fits in. I, I put submission instructions up here too because sometimes submissions are difficult. And Anne Marie is here to help, but sometimes the choice comes, rarely now, but sometimes the choice comes between really, really difficult and a lot less difficult means of, of submission. Yes. Yes, and, and ironically enough, no matter whether you're asking for 5,000 or 5 billion, it's still the same process. So you need to think about that as well, that investment of time and effort. Well, I took eight months or nine months. Mm -hmm. what, how, how do you handle that? Well, let me answer what I think is your first question, which is all about how to handle start dates in general, and then how to handle the question of, I want to start later, perhaps even outside the fiscal year for this particular funding. The first question, how do you handle start dates in general, I typically say to people, you're going to want to start the month after they give it to you. So if they give it to you in November 1, November 15, November 30th, you're going to want to start in December. So if you know already that they're going to give it to you um, in that period of time, you're going to want to give time for the institution to negotiate if you don't like the terms and conditions. If they ask for a revised budget and they shrink your budget and they say we can only afford this and you have to do some negotiating and you have to do some back and forth. So just because you are going to be expecting an award, it doesn't mean that you have to accept it either because it might contain amounts of money or project period time frames or some term or condition that you really either don't like or can't accept. And so it's well within the right of, of the institution to say, let's talk about this, whether or not we can actually accept this award. 
or whether or not we should accept this award. It's well within the right of the institution to say that and to go ahead and bring you in <clears throat> as appropriate on some of those negotiations. In terms of the second question, <clears throat> excuse me, the second question, it's all about talking to the program officer and asking where the money is at that moment, how it's being, for want of a better term, drained away by spending over a period of time. Some people will say, you really need to start now because you need to spend before the end of the fiscal year, before the end of our, the funder's fiscal year. You really need to start at this point, and we don't advise you waiting later. Other people will say, well, can we negotiate a different project timeline? Can we do a, a for want of a better term, um, some, some period of time in which you have a planning section of your project and then an implementation section? And sometimes they'll negotiate that. And they'll say, well, if you can't start until eight months out after award, then maybe those first eight months are really the planning period. And, and let's talk about what activities you can do during the planning period and what kinds of funds you can ask for within that planning period and how to set this up during that time frame. And it may be, it may be that that's useful to you, but that should be a conversation between, or I should say among, you and Anne-Marie and the program officer at that agency to figure out what would be the best possible choice, if that helps. Yep, definitely. Okay. In terms of award type and terms if listed, Sometimes you know immediately that you do not want this award. <laughs> if it tells you that you have to move to another country for 10 years and, and live among a group of people whose language you don't know, and in order to do that you'll get $500, well, maybe not. Maybe this might not be the award for you. And so if, if the terms are listed, then you might want to consider taking a close look at them. What would I have to do if I were awarded? What would I have to do? during the project process. How much reporting would I need to do? How much fiscal reporting, technical reporting and fiscal reporting would I need to do? How much assistance would I need to do that kind of reporting? Does my institution have this infrastructure? Now you do, some institutions don't. So there are questions sometimes. This also was particularly important during the, um, the uh, ARRA era, where you had all of this stimulus funding coming at universities, and all of a sudden the reporting was both faster and deeper. Instead of reporting once a year, some people were reporting once a quarter, something like that, something outrageous. And now, of course, now that universities have done it, the federal government is saying, well, gosh, you did it before. Can't you do it again? The bar is raised. Now, how about all this reporting? Come on. Let's do some reporting here. I would say that you have to juggle those responsibilities carefully. And, and let, me, let me answer what I think are two of your questions that are embedded in what you just said. First, I have a tremendous workload. How do I manage my grant? And second, I have a tremendous workload. How do I apply? How do I find time to apply? So let me take the second one first, okay? Okay. All right. How do I apply? Well, you've got assistance. Anne-Marie, and you all have what, what kind of indirect cost? Um, it's a um, 44.5% of MTDC? Uh, yes. MTDC, okay, modified total direct costs, okay. So, so the, um, the, the, the clerical support is built in? Yes. So that people can expect to have a certain amount of clerical support yep. at the departmental or school or college level? Yep, and, and through me. <laughs> and through you, okay, all right. So. That is officially the way it's supposed to happen. That, as, as you know, having worked at res more research intensive places, that, that you're supposed to have the clerical support. Um, in answer, though, to that first question of how do you apply, sometimes you have to suffer first. Okay? And I'm just going to have to be blunt and say that. Sometimes you have to suffer first for the, the, the likely outcome. And you know this, right? The second part, though, how do I manage, is you build in release time and or you build in clerical support as appropriate and as you can and as the funder will support. Um, so that you build in a postdoc or you build in a graduate student or a set of graduate students or advanced undergraduate students if that's possible, if they can do that kind of work. You build in administrative support into your grant. You uh, write yourself out for a certain amount of time 
that you know would take you to do the project so that your overall expenditure of time does not go over the 60 hours. I, I know it's 60. I know I work 60 hours myself, sometimes 80. But the overall expenditure of time will not go over that 100%. You will take a, we will carve a chunk out to, in order to do that project. But unfortunately, quite often you have to struggle first in order to get to that place where you can actually do the work when it's awarded. Does that? Well, the second is the, the second is not theory. The, the second part where you actually write yourself out in order to be able to do the work is not theory because you do in fact have release time and you do have the ability to give release time on projects. So so maybe I shouldn't have said you suffer. Maybe I should have said you suffer unless you have somebody to help you take the burden off your shoulders. Maybe I should have said it that way. Um, and you are fortunate that you have people who are investing in the pre-award proposal preparation stage here and making sure that um, making sure that you can not only do that but also the management of the of the award once once you receive the award that you can do that also with the assistance of the institution um, keep in mind that also the, it, it is the institution's award and they have reporting requirements of their own and compliance requirements of their own. So they're not going to let you fall off the face of the earth, especially once the award comes. They're not going to let you fall off the face of the earth. They're going to help you manage that project very carefully because it's their money as well as, it, as, well as you know, your project. It's, it's their money as well. And they have those requirements for, for compliance and reporting as well. Did you want to add to that, Anne-Marie? So that this is not an unfunded mandate. You actually have the chance to have a lot of the burden taken off your shoulders or a lot of assistance in doing both the proposal preparation and the award or project management. Um, you have a lot of assistance here. And that is different from many institutions that are in the same boat with the same number of uh, contact hours or credit hours, however they, however they choose to count it. It's, it's different from a lot of institutions in the same boat. There are plenty of places that are requiring an increase without giving support. And what you have here is, is a lot of support coming your way, I think, really. If that answers, or is it still theoretical to you? I don't entirely agree with your synopsis. Right, but, right. Uh, well, we can talk offline about it if you want. Sure. Okay, all right. Another part of the solicitation elements that you will see also in this NSF, where is the advanced solicitation? Right there? Okay. Um, there are references to <coughs> grants manuals. There are references to other pieces of information. There are references to uh, an entire body of work, of literature, work cited, references cited, that really shows you where all this funding trend, funding opportunity, this idea came from. So that what you have, especially in the case of NSF, for example, you have quite often a, a link to the grant proposal guide, the GPG. Um, you have a link to the application package, quite often, in the case of NIH and DOD, you have a link to the, to the application package, typically in grants.gov. With uh, National Science Foundation, it's typically in Fastlane, which is their homegrown version or in grants.gov. Then you have um, links to online tools such as how to convert from uh, Word to PDF or from Excel to PDF in order to upload documents into the submission system. And then of course you have your points of contact whom you ask for technical, excuse me, <coughs> technical and or other kinds of support. Now, in planning how to respond to a solicitation, or well, whether and how to respond to a solicitation, you need to think about the capacity and expertise of you and your team. What disciplinary expertise do you have that you will bring to this project? What other complementary or alternative or similar expertise will your team members bring to this project? How will that team, either yourself or the group, 
how will that team move forward in making this happen when awarded? Because remember, <clears throat> you're competing to do a project that's funded. You're not writing an article that says, this is a wonderful idea. You're competing to get a project funded that is time limited, that is funding limited, in order to make something happen that's good in the world. You're trying to do something that creates new, new ideas, new information. You're trying to make sure that all of this work that you've done will actually show something, have some kind of outcome or result that you can then publish, that will then add to the discipline, that will then add to your field. So do you have a team together that will be able to do this? Can you do it in the amount of time? Because there's always a limitation, almost always a limitation on time. Do you need external support for this? Do you need to bring in a consultant? Do you need to bring in a business partner or a community partner in order to do this kind of work? <clears throat> do you need to actually use certain kinds of planning tools in order to actually make this proposal happen over the time frame that you have between now when you've got the idea and the deadline date? So the question is, what do I need in order to make the proposal happen? <clears throat> and then what do I need in order to actually do the project once it's awarded? Because you have to think that way. The proposal is often referenced within the terms and conditions of award as this is the plan of how to do the project. So if the better you write the plan, the easier it is to do. Many solicitations are for letters of intent, letters of inquiry, letters of interest. That I stands for those three things, intent, inquiry, interest. Basically, this is used in one of two ways. It's used first as a possible gatekeeper, um, weeding out those ideas that the, that the funding agency will not be able to support. <clears throat> also keeps you from having to submit an entire proposal and spend months of your time, weeks or months of your time doing that. Um, so an LOI is, is typically one to two pages of information that is almost like a miniature micro version of a proposal. Absolutely. And sometimes the, um, if it's used as a gatekeeper, Sometimes it specifically says in the solicitation, you will be invited to submit a full proposal. And if you are not invited, do not submit. Other times they say, this is basically going to be used as a way to set up the review teams so that we understand where the proposals are coming from and what topics they have. And so if, even if you don't submit the, the LOI, you can still submit a proposal. But you have to, you have to see what the wording is. And if, if you can't quite tell what that wording is or what, what the understanding is, then you might need to pick up the phone and call Anne-Marie or pick up the phone and call the program officer or pick up the phone and call Anne-Marie to ask her to call the program officer. Right. So the first thing to do when you're looking at submitting an LOI is you need to think about understanding the funder. What is their mission? What is their vision? What are their values? What are they trying to do in the world? What kinds of programmatic funding opportunities have they put out there? Um, recently, in the past five years, in the past ten years, what do they do? Who are they? What do they do? Then you would want to align with their priorities. You would want to make sure that whatever you were doing was an investment that they would agree with or that you think they would agree with. And again, if you're not sure, you and or Anne-Marie can talk with the program officer about how well this might or might not align, this idea might or might not align with the, funding, with the funder's priorities. LOIs as a genre are typically, well, they have a typical shape. Um, and it is almost an academic shape. So what I'm going to ask you to do is take a pen and draw an X, a small X on your paper. And then draw a line across the top of the X and a line across the bottom of the X. Until what you have is an hourglass. Okay? 
The typical structure of an academic paper is broad, narrow, broad. Broad is what's gone on before. You're entering the conversation, but you're always already late to the conversation. You're trying to add something to the conversation, but this conversation has been going on in many cases for centuries, maybe even millennia, the conversations about these kinds of ideas. So it's broad, so you have to contextualize. Then you have to narrow to, this is what I want to talk about, right? And that's the skinny part of the hourglass. And then broaden back out again to say, how will my results be used? What ap applicability do I, do I think that this new idea has or these anticipated results? So if you think of it in that shape, it's the same thing with a letter of intent. You start with a contextualization, not the typical first year composition person, you know, from the beginning of the dark ages until the present, man has done, you know, not, not that kind of ludicrous thing, but setting the context, setting the, setting the scene for what it is that you want to do, and then narrowing to, after describing the gaps or describing the need or describing the problem, here's how I'm going to fill the gap or respond to the problem somehow solve this need in some fashion. And then these anticipated results or outcomes, this is what I, I feel sure will happen as a result of my project. And then afterwards, how can they be used? How will they add to the field? Broadening out again, how will they add to the field? In what ways is what I'm going to do? In what ways is my idea useful? Think about that, because again, this is not like this is not like an academic argument where where you're just trying to get people to believe you and agree with you. This is not just part of the conversation. This is not just cocktail party chatter. This is not just that. You're trying to get them to open their wallet and give you money. This is a sales pitch, as well as a a, a, a piece of persuasion, which is inherently more difficult. You can be persuaded all you like, but will you actually open your wallet? Well, no. You have a different set of criteria for that. Think about when someone asks you for money, your spouse, your child. What do you say, right? You say, I'm persuaded by that, but we don't have the budget, or but that's not a good enough idea, or, but that doesn't go along with my priorities, my plans, right? especially with a child. That really doesn't go along with my priorities or my plans. It's the same way with a funder. So the question becomes, how do I not only persuade them of the idea, but also of the value of that idea and make them actually open up their wallet to make this happen? Now let's talk about writing grant narratives to address the application review criteria. Let's go forward one more. I got it. I love the first bullet point on this slide. Read the instructions, and then the second, read all of the instructions. <laughs> because we tend to get excited over something that's very close to what we want to do, but not quite. We tend to get very, very excited. There, there have been plenty of times when I've talked to faculty members in, in, in my office when I was a um, well, now too, but when I was in uh, Central Research Administration at the, two, at the three universities that, um, that Anne-Marie mentioned earlier, I would always have faculty members come in and say, I'm so excited, I'm so excited, I'm so excited. And sometimes it would only be vaguely close to what they did or vaguely what they needed in order to do the kind of work that they wanted to do. And sometimes I had to bring them back down to earth and say, okay, this is close. Yes, that's correct. This is very close, but that's not what they're asking for. So you have to be careful, you have to look. And you have to go through the solicitation, you have to think, okay, exactly how am I gonna do this with this money? How does my idea really fit? Reading the instructions also, sometimes there's only one small line that makes a huge difference. And sometimes that one small line makes a tremendous amount of difference. I remember uh, one solicitation maybe um, three or four years ago, 88, 89 page solicitation, one line said something about how you had to put your budget in Excel and hand it in as part of that submission. 
and if it was in any other format, they, it would be returned without review. One line said that. If you happen to miss that line and you turn in your budget spreadsheet, having converted to PDF like you thought you were supposed to do, you would have lost any chance of that five or six or seven million dollar opportunity being awarded to you. So sometimes you have to read, and you have to read very closely. Sometimes it's very obscure, too. So if you're confused, talk with Anne-Marie, talk with the program officer, both of you together, talk with the program officer, and say, you know, we're confused. Over here on page 26, you say this. Over here on page 59, you say this other thing. They seem to be contradicting each other, which happens sometimes in solicitations. These seem to be contradicting each other. So how exactly is this supposed to work? Do we follow this one or this one? Also, when you're thinking about writing a proposal, you're needing, needing to think about it as a vision. Let me say what I mean here. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about budgets. When you are thinking about your project, you're thinking, okay, it's Tuesday, it's 110, what exactly am I doing in my project on a Tuesday at 110 in the afternoon? What exactly is going on? Do I see school buses full of students going to museums and art galleries? Do I see blow torches and welding equipment and people making things? Do I see CAD users in groups learning how to do some project? What, do I, what exactly do I see? And then what will it take in order to make that vision happen? Will I need to be there? Will another person need to be there supervising that activity? Will I need to have a certain number of students? Will they have to be paid? Will I have to have resources like computer labs? Will I have to have transportation? Will I have to travel to conferences in order to present on this? What will I need to do? What is that program vision? So you're going to be thinking about what that program vision is, and yes, building castles in the air and being, yes, a little bit unrealistic at the beginning, and then think, OK, how can I actually do this? How can I express the program vision in the required sections? Because you will always have a, required, a set of required sections. In the NSF, it's a very broad understanding of what those required sections are. But in the GPG, it spells out, these are the kinds of things you need to address. And so those are the kinds of questions that you were asked by Susan in order to do the NSF advance. So what is your program vision? How is it expressed? And those kinds of questions to prompt you to provide more and more and more detail also helps the proposal become more compelling and more persuasive. Because again, it's a plan. It's a plan for the project once it's awarded. So you have to have your detail already out there. If you don't, you'll get the award and you'll think, OK, wait, I didn't fully plan this. I'm not sure what I'm, what I'm doing. I have to put more effort into this to think about what, what it is that I'm doing. If you've already done that thinking, if you've already said, let me answer all these questions, let me think about this vision, then you actually have that plan right there in front of you. And you can say, all right, I have that little start thing, that CarMax commercial where you, you step on start and it always goes in front of you until it leads you to CarMax. Anyway, it's similar to the, to the funding idea. You're making sure to start at that award. It's, they've given you the funding you're ready to move. You're ready to go forward on that project. You always have to think about the review criteria. Sometimes they have to be expressed very bluntly and explicitly. In terms of NSF, you have to say the intellectual merit of this project is. The broader impacts of this project are in NSF. You have to say that. In, for NIH, you have to have significance and approach and other kinds of sections of the proposal set out with those kinds of headings. U.S. Department of Education, you have to answer certain questions that go along with the review criteria, and you have to answer them in a certain order, and they have a point value for every single question. So you have to make sure that you address those. Others, they're a little looser. Um, foundations, maybe, might say, well, you know, we're going to be reviewing this according to these basic general rules, guidelines, ideas. And you need to sort of print those out and paste those or tape those next to your computer as you're working so that you can have them right there. The question there also is, what is the submission method? Is it hard copy, which is really rare these days, or is it online? If it is hard copy, 
you will need to get to know your FedEx people. You will need to get to know your U.S. Postal Service people. You'll need to get to know the hours of everything around that is a FedEx Kinko's that can do copies after hours. But thankfully, most are electronic now. But there are a few. There are a few. So, so when you think about submission method, you also have to think about that. And the submission method also, National Science Foundation has a 5 p.m. deadline. Wherever you are, it's, if it's 5 p.m., it's finished. So the NSF advance needs to be in by 5 p.m. So when the clock ticks over from 4.59.59 to 5, that's late. Let me just say something about that. We had a, um, we had a faculty member who had worked for eight years, considering when the next funding opportunity would come for her graduate program. She was wanting to support something like 15 graduate students, and she was writing up until the 4.30 p.m. deadline, and we had warned her for three weeks, three and a half weeks. We had said, the hammer will come down at 4.30, because this was U.S. Department of Education. The hammer will come down, it will stop. She didn't believe us. So she cried when, she's, when she figured out that the screen had frozen for a reason. She had not even finished thinking through her idea because she was a very late type of, of, of individual. She had not even finished thinking through her idea. And so she wept on my shoulder. My shoulder got a little bit wet. So um, I said, you know, what are we going to do? And she said, well, we're going to wait for it to come around the next time. Well, in a dozen years, next time has not come. And it might not ever come. That was the last opportunity for that program. And it was worth a million five. And it would have supported her entire graduate program for five years while she got her feet on the ground and started something else. So the moral of the story is don't be late. Don't start late. Don't end late. If it's online, make sure you work with Anne-Marie so that she knows and make sure that you have the proper processing beforehand and make sure that you know exactly when that hammer is going to come down. If it's 5 p.m. your time, once it clicks around at 5 p.m., that's it. So you have to be ready to send it in beforehand. And yes, I have made it in under the line with 10 seconds to go. So yes, I know how that is. Let's talk about the writing process. Just as you have to have a plan for the project, you have to have a plan for the writing of the proposal. And you all need to agree. You, your team members need to agree. So you have to have some general expectations. Who will do what? Will there be a leader? Who's going to be that leader? It might be you. It might be somebody else. Who's going to be the scheduler? Is it going to be a, a, a clerical person in your, in your department? Is it going to be you? Is it going to be a, a, a co-investigator? Is there going to be a note taker, a person who takes the minutes? Who's that person going to be, typically? Are you going to assign that task to someone? Different sections of the proposal have to be written. Who writes those different sections? How will you make it all come together into that one common voice? Who will do that? Again, Hanover can help if it's within the queue, but if that particular project is not being served by Hanover, you also have to think about these kinds of questions. What are the tasks during the proposal? What's the timeline of the proposal? When we work with you, we actually have a proposal task and timeline calendar for you, and we talk about this is what has to happen on these days in order to make this work. And typically, we don't have much room for error. So if something happens and we have to restructure, sometimes we're scrambling a little bit to, 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 to reschedule or restructure. Always, though, have a plan B, maybe a plan C, D, E, and F, too, but at least a plan B, because things happen. Sometimes you'll have somebody on your team, and yes, this has happened, who dies suddenly, or somebody on, on your team who has a sudden illness and says, you know, I'm sorry, I can't be part of this team right now. I'm out sick. I'm in the hospital. I'm having an emergency surgery. You know, my child is having emergency surgery. My spouse is having real health problems right now. I can no longer do this. Who's going to take over that section of that person's, uh, 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 that person's section of the proposal? You have to have a plan B. Similarly, if you have hard copy and online as the two possible choices of submitting, sometimes you have to think, okay, if the, if the hard copy doesn't work, we're going to have to follow up with the online. That's going to be our plan B, et cetera. So you're going to have to think about if something goes wrong in this proposal development process or in this proposal submission process, how will I handle it? 
what will I do? What's my plan B, C, D, et cetera? Similarly, you're going to have to think about the possibility of, um, well, putting the proposal together as one coherent thing, one coherent document. Now, as a sales pitch, it's going to be different from anything else you've ever written. Let me say that again. It's going to be different from everything else you've ever written. Remember, we talked about how it's your idea, how it's also helping people or encouraging people to open up their wallets. You're going to be talking to them as a professional to another professional in much the same way that you would when you give a talk. It's not going to have to be nearly as formal as, in, in most, most cases, it's not going to ha have to be nearly as formal as when you write an article, because you'll have the conventions of your field. But quite often, you'll be able to be less formal, and you'll be able to think about this as, I'm giving a professional talk. And so you'll want to have that very personable, very conversational tone coming with the appropriate level of formality that will help people understand that you do, in fact, know what you're talking about. Available examples are at several different places online. Um, probably the best place for you all to go is the National Institute of Allergic and Infectious Diseases, N-I-A-I-D. The website for that is www.niaid nih.gov www.niaid.nih.gov You can also Google this by looking for All About Grants or All About Grants tutorials and sometimes you have to add NIAID in order to get it to come up to the top of the Google results. At that location and yes I know this is biomedical research and or community health research but bear with me at that location, you will see small pilot grants and also very large project and even center scale grants that have all been successful and they've all been annotated as to why they're successful. So you will see how reviewers think. That's the best part. You will see how reviewers think. So you will have examples of how people put something together and you'll see that the tone and the style are not stilted. They are not um, very uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. Instead, it's very um, the tone and style are very conversational, very informal. Very much this is what we're this is what we're doing. This is what we're talking about. So what you have is you have some examples out there. That's that's what I'm trying to tell you. N I A I D. In writing the narratives, I'm going to go a little faster through these. You're going to be wanting to develop the, the objectives and the outcomes to go along with the SMART acronym. And I'll talk about the SMART acronym in just a moment. You'll, you'll be wanting to make sure that your budget follows along with your idea and is able to support your idea, again, over the life of the project and within the boundaries that the funding agency has set. And then also, to, to uh, you also have to plan for program evaluation and sustainability as Dr. Gloria was talking about earlier. Dr. Ma was talking about earlier, sorry. SMART means specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and it used to be time-bound, and now it's timely. And we have some examples of those. And I'm going to go forward and then back. So. When you develop SMART objectives, you're going to be looking at qualitative and quantitative possibilities. What do you want to have accomplished at particular milestones during the project or at the end? What do you want to have accomplished? How do you know you will have accomplished those outcomes? Your project has accomplished those outcomes. How do you know? And here's some examples. Non-SMART would be children will understand the importance of physical activity. Well, how do you measure understand? Children outcome, children will maintain healthy body weight. What is healthy in relation to what? What, what standard? 
So a, a smart objective and outcome might have children will engage in a particular number of hours of physical activity daily. So instead of they'll just understand it, they'll actually do something. Or if you wanted to change this, it would be understand according to what? A test? A survey? Something like that. How will you know that the children will have understood it? Because this person needed to change it from understand to something more specific, they chose to change it to one hour of physical activity daily. The outcome, the first one is children will maintain healthy body weight. The um, SMART objective and outcome, the outcome is 80% of children will maintain normal body mass index, BMI values. There's the objective standard, 80% of the objective standard. So again, it's measurable. Let me go forward one more. For a, this is for a telemedicine program. Telemedicine will provide necessary medical services to underserved rural, rural residents. Uh, what are necessary services? What are underserved rural residents? We don't know. We aren't sure. In terms of the outcome, more patients will experience timely access. What's timely? To quality health care without having to travel. What's quality health care? How is it measured? How is it described? Instead, let's go with something that we can, in fact, measure, can, in fact, describe. Telemedicine technology will enable provision of medical care at six rural clinic sites. Provision of medical care. We haven't defined it yet, but it'll be defined within the proposal. Outcome, 75% of patients will be able to access health care services in their home communities. We haven't defined those services. Those will be defined in the proposal. You see how they're different, the bad and the good. And maybe you do that later in the proposal, but... You would want to, yeah, yes. Not only that it's local, it's so you don't have to wait five months to get the plan. Exactly, exactly. And there's also the possibility that, that embedded within this bullet point, more patients will experience timely access to quality health care. There might be a timely function that you might want to use one outcome for, and then there might be a quality health care function that you might want to show in another outcome. So it may be split out yep. as well, and you may decide to do that. Let me go back, actually, to how to develop the SMART objectives and outcomes, to, you would need to make sure that you spell out exactly how the project will be implemented. You're walking the reviewer through the process. You're detailing the activities. We talked about how Dr. Ma's NSF Advance is detailing all the activities. Uh, devising some quantifiable outcomes, method of measuring and assessing those outcomes as an evaluation plan, and remembering to keep it realistic and attainable. A lot of people, when they start out trying to write grants, they say, for $50,000, I will change the world. I will absolutely change the world. It will transform everything. It's the next thing since sliced bread. It's the best, best, absolute thing in the world. Be realistic here. What will $50,000 get you? It will get you a certain set of activities that will produce a certain set of outcomes. How will those outcomes have impact on your discipline? What, will, what exactly will they do? They might have a fairly limited impact, but it is still reasonable to say that they will have an impact. So maybe scale down some of the language there and say, within this limited vision of the $50,000 proposal or project, this is what we think, my team and I think, this will actually do for my discipline. Very quickly, program budgeting. Here are some typical cost categories, personnel, fringe benefits, supplies and materials, equipment, travel, contractual, and indirect costs. Let me remind everyone at this point that um, travel is being scrutinized more and more closely ever since the, um, was that the General Accounting Office conference where they had the $40 muffins? Anyway, it hit the news. And there, there's other things, yeah. But that was, that was one of the most egregious ones within the federal government. Um, where the federal agency actually did the misspending. Um, let me also remind people that supplies and materials and equipment are two different things. It used to be that computers were so expensive that they were a, a piece of equipment. Now they are supplies because the federal definition of equipment is now $5,000 or more per item. And if they all collect together into one thing, then that thing, if it costs $5,000 or more, is one single item. So, just letting you know. Again, we've got a project vision. We want to make sure it's got all the adequate resources. To show that, we have to justify that. 
when they can't justify them. Okay, let me, let me give an example, okay? And yes, we're right here. That's why I said that. Exactly, Chuck. Um, a lot of people are given desktops and or laptops as part of their employment, their typical employment, right? If you already have the laptop, don't ask for another one unless you absolutely have to have that extra computing power to do X, Y, Z when you're out in the field. If your university-issued institutional laptop is sufficient, use your laptop. Simple as that. If the desktop in your office is sufficient, use your desktop in your office. If you're going to another location and you have to have significant computing power in that location plus a satellite uplink, yeah, sure, you might need to purchase a different laptop with the connection so that you can do your work. But think about it always as how do I get what I need to do my work? And then what would seem reasonable versus what would seem unreasonable? Remember, this is your money too, especially in terms of the federal government. This is your money too. It's coming out of your pocket. All of us are paying somewhere between, oh, I don't know, 20, 25 to 40%-ish of our income. All of that money goes somewhere. It comes back to you, in this instance, in the form of grants. So whatever you do will be reported to your program officer, which will be reported to that agency, which will be reported to Congress. Trust me, you don't want to be the subject of a congressional discussion of how poorly taxpayers spent their money. You do not want to be on the front page of the paper for being like that NFL football team that, that got a grant from NSF for studying grass, <clears throat> the effects of growing grass on their playing field. You don't want to be like them. Okay? You really don't want to be that 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 person. So when you when you think about what do I need and how do I how do I think about justifying that, you think about calculating that out. How does it actually work? How does it how did I derive these figures? And how does it relate back to the grant activities? Go ahead. You mentioned uh, fringe benefit charges. Are there other things involved? That's, um, that's usually uh, Social Security, um, uh, health care, and all of that. And usually there is a, there is a, 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 an averaged figure. Yeah. Right. OK. So you'll be able to ask your sponsored programs people yeah. what that is. And if they have to piece it out and say, this is for this, this is for this, this is for this, then they have a way to do that. Because rarely, but sometimes you have to piece it out, sometimes. So here's some examples. Again, this is bad, this is good. So here, $50,000 was requested for a project director. So how do we know that that $50,000 is appropriate? We don't know. You say, OK, this person is going to have qualifications. You know, one one person FTE, full-time equivalent, project director. This person will be hired to do what? See, implement and manage the program. It's very specific. Salary costs are calculated fair market value. So there is a discussion at your institution of what that fair market value is. And therefore, we've agreed that it's all, the fair market value is all $50,000 for this kind of position. At an institution approved cost of living adjustment, blah, blah, blah. Okay. That is the kind of level of detail that the, that the program officers and the reviewers are going to be looking at, looking for, in fact. Here's another example, program evaluation. A lot of people want to say the first thing that says nothing to the reviewer. Instead, here's what the cost is, and here's how we derived it, and here's what the evaluating firm will do, the consulting firm or the evaluating firm will do. Very specific. So, yes, I realize that many agencies and funders now have limits on pages of their, um, of their uh, budget narratives or budget justifications. But be that as it may, you will find a way to say as much as possible in as few words as possible. It's like poetry. You're going to pack as much meaning into that as possible. <laughs> then when we talk about program evaluation, you're going to have to think, okay, I've planned my entire project. I know I'm going to have some outcomes. How do I know, based on these outcomes, how do I know that the process worked, that the outcomes 
showed that everything was successful or effective, how do I know? Quite often you have to, to mention formative assessment and summative assessment. Formative assessment typically comes within the grant project at different milestone points, giving you a chance to make a course correction if needed. So basically, it allows you to take an outcome at perhaps a third of the way through, half the way through, and then be able to say, okay, this is not working. We have to make a slight change and do something in a different way. Summative assessments is a retrospective look, that look back, saying, how do we know the entire thing, that entire period, was successful or effective? What lessons did we learn? And this is all about wanting to see the return on the investment and measuring the level of project impact. Some assessment strategies include observations or logs or records, or other kinds of quantifiable data. And you would also want to make sure that you showed a collaborative effort. Sometimes you might want to identify people who are going to be providing certain kinds of services for the project or some sort of advisory councils being, being there to, to provide that kind of support. And if you have commitment to the project, you're going to be wanting to have those signed letters of commitment signed by someone who has the authority to commit that other organization to assist you or to participate in that project, not just anyone. Sustainability is also a concern these days, not only how to evaluate but how to sustain over time after the project has been funded. So after that funding period is over, is it going to drop dead? Is the effort going to, going to stop? Let's hope not. Let's hope it will continue. And so the question becomes, so how are we going to continue this effort after the funding, after the investment? How are we going to continue this so the investment will not be lost? And here are some questions that people ask. Will the program become part of your operating budget? Will you approach other funders? Will local stakeholders contribute to keep the project afloat? Those are some of the questions that people ask in order to make that happen. Now, I've rushed through this last little bit because I knew I talked a lot earlier, but um, what questions or concerns do you have at this point, thinking back over what we talked about during this entire about hour and a half? What questions do you have right now? What do you mean by red flags? Well, conference travel is one thing, but if, if all the conferences are in Florida or Hawaii, then there's a problem, especially if they, the, the reviewers don't know the names of those other organizations or their meetings, and they suspect that you are going to have a beach conference, right? So that's a problem. Um, there are also problems of, of, of uh, asking for too much or padding the budget, problems of uh, questioning how much do you really need this piece of equipment, how much do you really need this administrative personnel, um, how, how much do you really need to have this co-investigator on your project, they're not really contributing very much that I can see, you'll, you'll, you'll get a response like that maybe. Then the equipment question or supplies question, do you really need this computer, do you need these, um, these supplies, do you really need this big, enormous, highly expensive piece of equipment? How many times are you actually going to use it? If you're going to use it four times in six years, do you really need to spend $75,000 on it? Really? Um, especially if those four times are only like 30 minutes each time. So you have to think about the questions like that. And, and you also have to have concerns about commitment, um, especially committing the institution's time or resources. We actually had a case um, where a person wrote six words. The university will cover those costs. Problem. This person had not um, arranged for that to be a part of the real promise. It was not caught in the proposal process or in the award process. And as a result, 400 students were fed and housed for a period of 10 weeks each summer for five summers at the cost of the university. 400 students. So, so you need to be careful as to what you promise and how you promise. 
And, and if, you, if, you, if you mention that certain activities are going to happen and you don't have that in your budget, the, uh, the agency, the funder, assumes that, okay, your institution, your organization, or your team will cover those costs, cover those activities. So you have to think about those kinds of things. And I'm sure, Anne-Marie, you'll be looking at those very closely. Exactly, exactly. And there are times when the institution will say, I'm sorry, our, our commitment has changed, or I'm sorry, we cannot put this out there. You know, we, we simply cannot support this as an institution. Um, for example, if you are, uh, if you have required cost share, or if you're using, if you're, if you're applying to a, to an organization that does old school cost share, where the more cost share you give, the, the more likely it is that you will get awarded. That's old school, not current. Um, but if you're applying to something like that and, and you think, okay, I want $25,000, so I'm going to promise $500,000, the institution is going to say no. You know, this is way too much promise to get this little tiny $25,000 pot of money. Typically, in most cases, we'll say that, unless it's highly prestigious, in which case you might consider. But, you know, y you have those kinds of considerations that you would need to bring forward during the proposal process, the proposal development process, and talk with Anne-Marie and or Chuck about those kinds of issues and to say, you know, can the university support this kind of thing? It, it, it is a competition. You have to remember that. And so you always have to ask yourself, how does my idea, how is my idea better, more effective, more efficient, more special in some way? How, is, how does it differentiate itself from the others? How can I know that mine is more likely to be awarded? How is it competitive? Part of that is um, doing things like going to conferences, talking with the program officers, talking with other academics, finding out where, there's gap, where those gaps are in your field, because remember, Every single project that you take on to, in order to, to, to do something new in the field, to provide some or, or to create some new scholarly uh, advance in the field, every single time you do that, it's like a, another version of your senior thesis, master's thesis dissertation. Just, just like that, you're, you're spelling out what the landscape is in your field, the ideas, the landscape of ideas in your field. You're spelling out where the gaps are, where something has not worked or has not happened that you want to make happen, and you're going to either fill or partially fill that gap. And you're going to be coming with something that is new, innovative, original, or at least partly new, innovative, or original, in order to make sure that yours is among the forefront of what people consider. Um, but I would caution you not to, not to use your idea like Play-Doh and screw it up into different kinds of shapes that then you don't recognize anymore, simply go after this funding. Because um, there are ways in which to take a piece of the project out and have it funded over here, another piece of the project or another piece of the idea out and funded over here. And so over a period of time, you might actually have multiple mini projects that give you a trajectory across 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years as opposed to waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain with that one funding opportunity that will do everything you want it to do. And sometimes you have to, to piece it out that way, if that, if that helps. Chuck? Oh, I wonder what they're looking for. Exactly. They're looking for the right man. Exactly. And, and I would say that that relationship building happens at both levels, but yes, it's much more apt and much more appropriate to get that deeper relationship going and the foundation, the small family foundation the local. And interestingly enough, funders are like people. They want to jump on the bandwagon. Once they see momentum going forward, you've already got one small project, two small projects, all of a sudden you can scale up to a mid-range size project or to a large project because you have those preliminary data. You have that track record of success. You have already shown that you can handle this 10 or 15 or 20 or $25,000 project, therefore you must be ready now for a $100,000 project. Once you've done that, you must be ready for a you know, $500,000 project. Once you've done that, you must be ready for a $5 million project. You know? So there's a scale. Yeah. And for us here at Wentworth, a good example of an ability. So, so part of it is also being strategic and, and asking, okay, what is my individual trajectory, my career trajectory? What do I want it to be? What resources do I need in order to make that happen? How does it fit into my departmental, school, or institution-wide st 
strategy or strategic plan, how does it fit into the funding agency's trends? You know, what's, it's not just about can I twist my idea to, to, to fit it to whatever's hot right now? Um, because that, that way lies madness, really. Um, next year, are these guys your templates to go forward? Thank you. <laughs>